I just like to uh, say thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to be here tonight. I um, treasure this time to speak to uh, you college students. I met the um, Christian students on campus way back when I was in college as a sophomore. And I can definitely testify it changed my Christian life for sure. And also my human life uh, has been greatly enriched by my relationship with um, the Christian students organization and club. And I really, uh, because of that, I, I, I like to give back basically and have been stayed in touch with the group and even involved with the group to one degree or another over the years. So uh, that's been a great blessing to me. Um, probably I can't even you know, say how much I've been blessed by that. So um, tonight we're gonna get into a message called uh, the two responses to uh, suffering. I know we've been studying basically the book of Job in the Old Testament, along with Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, these are books that, you know, not many people, well, I should say, especially Job, not many people understand, you know, what's going on in that book. It, of course, um, as the brothers have mentioned in the previous messages, talks about, uh, tries to answer, uh, or we can, you know, answer the great question, which has two parts. Why did God create me or man? And the second part of that is why does God, you know, allow or why does he deal with his chosen people, allow them to suffer? Which is a big question, right? Why do bad things happen to good people? Or even why do these kind of things, why does God allow this to happen to Christians? And even more specifically <laughs> to me, why is this happening to me? <laughs> so anyway, the, question, the Job, book of Job, in that book, we see the answers to this question. Basically, the answer is that God has a purpose and God's purpose is that we gain him. Uh, so unfortunately, Job, even though he was so wealthy and, and even in a sense godly, he was not gaining, he was not truly gaining God. He wasn't having experiences of God. He, he just heard about God. He knew about God in his mind, and, but he didn't actually have real you know, experiences with God. And so as a result, God had to do a big work, or actually God didn't do the work. So he allowed Satan to do the work to uh, reduce him, strip him down. And eventually, at the end of the book, Job gains God. You know, after 42 chapters, <laughs> we finally, God finally gets through. Job is reduced from what he was at the beginning, and he gains God. And that was really, you know, God's intention all along. And eventually, Job gives him all these outward blessings again and so forth. But Job is not the same at the end of the book. And brothers and sisters, I hope we are not the same at the end of this pandemic at the end of uh, whatever kind of suffering we're passing through, at the end of our college years, right? They're full of suffering, little, little sufferings uh, and so forth. In what way? We wouldn't be the same in the sense that we would have more God. We, would, we, have, we will have had more real life experiences of God and our sufferings unfortunately help us to do this. So, okay, let's, uh, let's look at the outline here. And um, one of the main things, I don't know if y'all have it up there, but uh, the first, point is the need for a clear vision of what God is doing with us. If you don't see this, then it becomes, you, know, you get very confused when sufferings come, you know, to yourself or to others. I mean, my wife, Betty, she's often confused when she looks at other people and she's, why is this happening to her? You know what? I just don't understand. Well, if we have a clear vision of what God is doing with us and with others, then it, it becomes a little easier to see. So let me just read this to you. Um, Basically, the first part of this verse is very famous, and I'm sure most of you have heard this. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So there we see God has a purpose. And this first part is what people use at, um, you know, funerals and different other kind of calamities. Oh, you know, don't worry, God causes all things to work together for good. But, and it talks about his purpose, okay, but then what is the purpose, and let me, read you the, let me read you the rest, because those whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those whom he predestinated, these he also called, and those whom he called, these he also justified, and those whom he justified, these he also glorified, so right here we see the purpose which is that we would be, and I have it high, underlined there, conform to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So you may never have realized before that you're a, a brother of Jesus. 
uh, <laughs> I didn't realize that, and that's kind of blows my mind. But we, through um, Christ's death and resurrection, he went from being just the only begotten Son of God that we saw in John three sixteen. You know, when he when he was there on the earth in his uh, earthly ministry at his baptism, God testified from the heavens, "This is my Son, <laughs> you know, the beloved, in whom I have found my delight." And John says that. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So at that time, Jesus was called the only begotten son. But look at this verse. This is now this verse is not during his earthly ministry. This verse is during his heavenly ministry. It's after his death and resurrection. And he's called the firstborn. OK, <laughs> how does the only begotten son become the firstborn son? You know, Benjamin is my son. He's got the same last name as me. Okay, so at one time, Benjamin was the only begotten son in our family. And then, guess what? <laughs> we had two more. We had twins. And Benjamin then became the firstborn son. So in Christ's death, well, really in his resurrection, he was made the firstborn son of God. He was born in his humanity as the firstborn son of God. And we were born right after him or even right with him to be the many brothers. So when... When were you, uh, a lot of people say, well, I was saved 20 years ago, or I was regenerated, you know, 10 years ago, or whatever. I well, really, you were regenerated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's when you were regenerated. Uh, you were brought forth as one of the many sons. So you were foreknown by God. You were predestinated by God. And what is your destiny? What is my destiny? Well, from this verse, I know what my destiny is. You know, I may not know how I'm going to get there. You know, there's a lot of ways to get to the to the goal, but the end, the destiny, my destiny is to be fully conformed to the image of the firstborn son of God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are going to look like him <laughs> in, in what? In our expression, in our, uh, in our inner being. And what does that look like? Well, you just look at him in the gospels. He's full of love. He's full of light. He's full of compassion. He's full of mercy. He's full. I just go on and on. Basically all the bountiful attributes of God and his divinity got expressed in the aromatic virtues of Christ in his humanity. And you read the gospels and you say, wow, that smells so good. What a man. What a <laughs> the son of God smells good. It smells like God expressed in a man. So as we grow in life and as the Lord grows in us, that is what's going to come out of us. People will, oh, wow, there's a person here who's you know, faithful and true and pure and, and, you know, on and on and on. Uh, so that's what the Lord's intention is with us. So unfortunately, suffering is part of the game or not game, but the plan. And, you know, I, I was thinking if you were, if I was here to, tonight telling you all about uh, becoming uh, doctors, right? Um, <laughs> medical doctors, I might be telling you, well, you know, you're going to make all these figures, seven figures, six figures, whatever. And um, not only that, you'll be able to save people and blah, blah, blah. I could tell you all the good things about being a medical doctor. But really, if I was faithful to you, I would also tell you, if you're going to take this path, if, you're, if you want the destiny of being a medical doctor, you're going to have to suffer. That's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to pass through a lot of suffering. And, and probably if a, you know, I'm not a medical person, but uh, if uh if I was able to, as a medical person, I would tell you all the different sufferings, the late nights, the, you know, the tests, the, you know, on and on and on, the internships, working for no money, on and on and on. Same with being a soldier. Okay, I want to be a soldier. That's, I want my destiny to be a soldier. What do soldiers <laughs> have to go through? Training. But in that training, there's a lot of what? Suffering. And eventually you're out on the battlefield. What's out there? Is that fun? Suffering. So... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, to be faithful as Christians, you know, we shouldn't tell people, oh, it's just going to be all happy and gleeful and, you know, God's going to bless you and on and on and on, which is what you hear sometimes from the televangelist. It's just, oh, you just have faith and God will take care of you and he'll heal you and he'll give you money and he'll give you this and he'll give you that. And one time there was a brother, you know, Watchman Nee over in China. He's a famous Christian author and a faithful brother. And he, you know, he was trying to preach the gospel to this young man. And the guy's like, you know, well, if if I believe in Jesus, will he fill my rice bowl? Will Jesus fill my rice bowl? In other words, if he'll fill my rice bowl, I'll believe in him. But watch when he was faithful. He told him, actually, if you believe in Jesus, he may break your rice bowl. <laughs> so, 
So anyway, I'm not here to give us bad news, but at the same time, we need to be armed. Peter says we need to be armed with the mind to suffer, that we wouldn't be surprised or shocked when either we or others pass through suffering. We realize this is part of the, of the, um, the pathway to sonship, okay, to become full-grown sons of God that express, fully express uh, God in Christ. Okay, so now I'm going to, um, let's see, I'm going to try to share my screen, Grace, if I can do that here. Let me see. It looks like I can. Okay. Just to show you real quick, um, here's a little picture of the created man, and y'all have probably seen this before, but there's the, the body, the soul, and the spirit there. Um, so we have a body as our outward container to contact the things of the, uh, the physical realm. We have the soul, which really involves our mind, our emotion, and our will to contact the things of the psychological world. And of course, we have our, our well, but the Bible tells us that we have a spirit in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Hebrews 4.12, and other verses. We have a spirit, and that part of us was made by God to contact and receive, even contain God himself, the things of the spiritual world. Okay, so then I'm going to put another picture here. This is what we look like when we get regenerated, okay? When we believed in the Lord, he came into us, and you know, we're, we are um, the temple, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul says in, you know, in um, First uh, Corinthians. And what does this look like? This looks just like a little temple. You know, temple had three parts. We have three parts. Where does God live in the temple, in the Holy of Holies? Where does God live in us, in our spirit? So he's there as life. And he's there. Listen, <laughs> that, that one inside of us is the Holy Spirit. And he is the reality of Christ himself. So who's in me? Wow, I have God in me. I have Christ in me. I have the Holy Spirit in me. And this one is life to me. So I have, wow, I have the entire triune God as life to be what? Experienced and enjoyed by me. Oh, you know, my life, this is what Seesaw really helped me to do as a, as a young Christian was to contact the Lord who's living in me. And he supplies me with life, with joy, with peace, with, uh, with himself uh, as all these things. That, that is what made the biggest difference in my life was learning to contact the Lord in my regenerated spirit. And when that happened, everything changed. <laughs> so, of course, we would encourage you to learn to contact the Lord who's living in you day by day. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, different ways we can do that. But basically, you turn your heart to him, open your mouth to him and uh, and and, and uh, let him well up within you. Okay, so then as that happens, as that happens, as we contact the Lord, enjoy the Lord, or supplied with the Lord, we even use the term that Jesus used in John 6, eat the Lord, drink the Lord, that's in John 7 and John 4, and these are just kind of strange terms maybe to you, but we can eat and drink the Lord Jesus spiritually to what? Grow. So God doesn't want, this is the beginning, but God doesn't want us to stay here. He wants us to grow, and that growth is right here in the you know, those little arrows, and this is a very simplistic picture, making it look very simple and easy, but God has a, actually, he has a hard time getting out from our spirit into all the parts of our mind, emotion, and will, our soul, that he could be expressed through us as all those aromatic, you know, virtues, his divine attributes could reach others. Um, anyway, and then finally, of course, he will tr even transfigure our mortal body, and then we will be a full, grown, glorified son of God, set to inherit all things with him we're not only we weren't i mean we were children we became sons and now we're the happy inheritors <laughs> with the lord as the uh, firstborn son all right i'm gonna stop sharing there and we'll get back to the outline um okay so there's also another verse there that just talks about the christian suffering and my thing just kind of something went wrong here with my oh there it is okay so um yeah, 1 Peter 5.10 just, just shows you, you know, he who called you into his eternal glory. That's where we're going, into his eternal glory. And the way we're going there is by the growth in life. After you have suffered a little while, okay? So anyway, uh, that's part of the plan. He, will, he himself will perfect, establish, strengthen, and ground you. Okay, then I wanted to show you here, because um, sometimes I'm like, you know, these people, they listen to these televangelists and everything. And we have the gospel of prosperity out there. It's very prevailing. And 
the problem with that is that it's leading people to the wrong, you know, the wrong direction. Instead of focusing them inward on the Lord in them as life, it's focusing them on all these outward things. And actually, it's very interesting that the Lord may strip us of it. He may or may not. But I mean, we may strip us of the outward things, especially if they're a distraction. And if you have a big distraction, um, <laughs> you know, if my wife is distracted by something and I'm not getting enough attention from my wife, you know what might happen to that thing? <laughs> it may go in the trash can because <laughs> I need to have her, you know, attention. If she's super distracted. Anyway, same with us and the Lord. If we are so distracted, he may just have to take that thing away. Uh, anyway, sorry, I'm getting distracted. I'm getting distracted by the distraction. Okay, let's get back to uh, Jesus, the prototype and pattern of the New Testament. So I'm always shocked. Um, the reason I said that is I'm always shocked when I talk to these people. And it's like, do you not know who your master is? The firstborn, the, the, the prototype, the uh, forerunner, the captain, you know, the, the one who went before us, the pioneer. What did his life look like? Was he full of outward blessings? Was he living in a mansion? Was he, uh, <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> why would you think that, uh, you know, we would, anyway, so I'm, I'm not going to ramble on that anymore, but it's just, uh, it's just interesting. I'm going to go back to my little thing here. And I'm going to read you some verses about the Lord Jesus from Isaiah. Um, this is in Isaiah 53, and it describes the Lord Jesus in a way that we may not consider him because we may have this picture of him as a, you know, really nice looking white guy. Uh, that we've seen. That was probably Michelangelo's roommate. <laughs> but the real Jesus didn't look like that. Let me read you how what he looked like and what he grew up like. Um, this is Isaiah 53, 2 through 5. For he grew up like a tender plant. This is also on your outline. Before him, like a root out of dry ground. Um, the dry ground being poverty, probably, you know, a carpenter's home, very poor situation. You know, God could have put him in a king's home as a son, but he put him in this very humble, poor, you know, even despised region. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so that's the dry ground. He had no attracting form. Okay, Michelangelo's roommate looks pretty attractive, but Jesus had no attracting form nor majesty that we should look upon him, nor beautiful appearance that we should desire him. So people were not flocking to him because he looked like Joel Olstein. Sorry, Joel, but, um, <laughs> you know, that's not what Jesus looked like. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Can you believe this is talking about the Lord Jesus? And like one from men, from whom men hide their faces. Oh, my God, there he is again. I'm not going to even look over there. <laughs> you know? Wow, that just blows your mind. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he, he has borne our sicknesses and carried our sorrows, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. That's what people thought of him because of the way he was in a suffering, you know, poor situation. He was wounded because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. The chastening of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we have been healed. <laughs> Great verse. Okay, so that's the Lord Jesus, um, you know, there. And uh, so was his life a life of blessing? Absolutely, but not the kind of blessing that we, uh, you know, we may have a concept about. And then even in, here's Hebrews 2.10, uh, for, for it was fitting for him, that's Jesus, for whom are all things and through whom are all things and leading many sons into glory. So he's taking the lead and we're following him to make the author of their salvation perfect through what? <laughs> through sufferings. Wow. You know, Christ in his divinity was perfect, but he in his humanity, there was something that needed to be perfected. That human being, Jesus of Nazareth, needed to be perfected. And the only way to perfect him was through sufferings. Is that not amazing? Okay. So even the master. Okay. But you may say, well, you know, I, I can't really relate to Jesus. I mean, he's he's the you know son of God, and I'm you know I got all kinds of problems and so forth. So let's look at Paul. And Paul, you know, in First Timothy one sixteen, he says that God gave Paul as a pattern. He set him forth as a pattern to all those who were to inherit eternal uh, salvation, eternal life. So that's that's us. Paul was given as a pattern to us. And let's look at the pattern here, okay? And I'm going to share with y'all again here. 
Sorry for all the back and forth. I think it's better than looking at my face the whole time. All right, so here's the, let's forget the Paul here. Okay, so here's Paul's, some, some Paul's blessing. <laughs> Actually, Paul said he was blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, and we are too. So much blessing and riches inwardly in our inner being. We have Christ as the all-inclusive, uh, wonderful one. He's so rich. He's so vast. He's so great. Uh, but hourly, we may have nothing. So let's let's read about Paul. So Paul's talking about himself here. You can consider Second Corinthians as an autobiography of Paul. And basically, some people were coming and trying to tell the believers that, hey, don't listen to Paul. He's not. You know, we're, we're super apostles. He's, he's not really that much. So Paul's comparing himself. He says, ministers of Christ, are they? I speak as being beside myself. I more so. And so here's how he vindicates his apostolic authority. I, in labor is more abundantly. In imprisonments, and I underlined a few of the key words, more abundantly. In stripes, those are whippings, <laughs> excessively. In deaths, often. Under the hands of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes less one. That means he was whipped 39 times with a whip, a leather whip, <laughs> until his back was like hamburger. Of course, the Jews, they would, mercy, they, would, they would put mercy into their punishment and take off one, making it 39. So, you know, just to show how merciful they were. But anyway, he was whipped by the Jews five times. Okay, I don't know about y'all, but I think after one time, you know, I would be done. <laughs> Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I spent. The, that means he was out in the ocean floating around for a whole night and a whole day, you know, just out there <laughs> holding on to a log or something. I mean, you can't imagine. And surely, what do you think he's thinking out there? <laughs> I mean, I know I'd be like, is this really God's way, will for me? I mean, am I, am I on the wrong path and what's going on here? But anyway, he had a vision. Paul had a vision. And he was not only had the vision of what God was doing, but he also was in contact with the one who was in his spirit. And that is how he passed through all of that. So that's really the key to this message is seeing the vision and staying in contact with the Lord who's in our spirit. So then he was stoned, uh, shipwrecked three times. Uh, okay, sorry. In journeys, in dangers of rivers, in dangers of robbers, in dangers from my race, in dangers from the Gentiles, in dangers in the city, in dangers in the wilderness, in dangers in the sea, in dangers among false brothers in labor and hardship, in watchings often, that means he couldn't sleep, in hunger and thirst, that means he didn't have enough to eat and drink. It's just hard to imagine the Apostle Paul in this kind of situation. In fastings often, that means they didn't have any food, so they just fasted. And in cold and nakedness, and I, man, that last one, I, they didn't have even enough clothes to wear out there. It's just as shocking um, the, <laughs> to read the account of Paul's life, and you're just like, whoo, uh, is this God's blessing, you know, or whatever? Look, <laughs> Paul suffered immensely for the sake of Christ. And as a result, he's going to be filled with glory. Okay, but let's see now. Um, I'm thinking here, got to unshare that. All right, here we go. So back to the, uh, the outline here. So now you see the prototype and the pattern, the way that we are on as Christians is not necessarily maybe the way that it's portrayed out there there's suffering involved. And, but, uh, but praise the Lord, this suffering works out for us something in a very positive way. We gain God and God gains us. And it results in the many sons of God, the family of God that will express God for eternity. So we're on, we have a wonderful destiny. We need to keep our eyes on the, just like a medical student has to keep their eyes on the prize, the destiny. We need to keep our eyes on the destiny, keep our eyes on the new Jerusalem <laughs> and, and so forth. So, Okay, I'm going to go on here to Job's response, because now we get to the two responses to sufferings. And Job, and this is often our response as well, and we have to admit, what was, what was his response? Cursing, complaining, and waiting to die. He was just cursing, complaining, and waiting to die. <laughs> Maybe that's the way we've been in this pandemic, or during the, all the different things that happened this year, or during Snowmageddon. Uh, let, look at these verses, Job 3, 1. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. You ever done that? Cursed? The day. That's pretty bad. Um, and then Job 10, 1. My soul loathes my own life. I will let my complaint have free course in me. I will speak in the 
bitterness of my soul. So Job was so bitter, he was just just pouring out, uh, probably to anyone that would listen, for sure his three friends, all the bitterness. And finally, what, what, the last one, my spirit is broken. My days are extinct. The graveyard is ready for me. So Job, he did not see what God's purpose was in his sufferings. He didn't even see who was behind it, that Satan was behind it. But he didn't understand that God was allowing this for a purpose. And he wasn't in contact with God himself. Had he been, he would have had a different reaction. And actually, he does have a bit of a different response when, when he does, when the Lord appears to him. But Paul, okay, but let's look at Paul now in the New Testament. Paul's response to suffering. So the point of this message is we can have one or two responses when we're suffering. We can have Job's response or Paul's response. Let's read Paul's response. Uh, Paul's response to suffering, rejoicing, praying, singing, and praising. Let me just read that again. Okay, he's suffering there. He's what? Rejoicing, praying, singing, and praising. Which response do y'all want to have? <laughs> Cursing, complaining, and waiting to die? Or rejoicing, praying, singing, and praising? So in Philippians 4.4, when Paul is in jail, you know, those jails were not the same as they are nowadays. Let me tell you. Uh, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And in that epistle, he was rejoicing as well, even in his suffering. And so then in Acts 16, 25, there's just this exemplary story of, um, of Paul and, and Silas. After they were uh, stripped of their clothing, they were, called, they, they were you know, beaten, naked, I guess, imprisoned and put in stocks in the, down in the dungeon or of the jail. Listen to this. And about midnight, Paul and Silas, does it say while complaining, cursing and waiting to die? No, it says, while praying, they sang hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So what a reaction, right? They're praying, singing, and praising. Oh, isn't that tremendous? And you know why? Because they had a vision, and they also, they also were in touch with the one who was filling them with joy and peace and glory right there in that suffering situation. I tell you, if you touch the Lord inwardly, in spite of a very negative situation, it can con completely change you on the inside. Even to the point people will be looking at you, going, "What? What? Wait a minute! Is it? Didn't something just happen to him? Why is he? Why is he smiling?" And you're like, "Well, I'm not smiling because of the situation. I just lost all my money, or, or whatever. I just wrecked my car, but I have a vision, and I contacted the one." You know, I'm in, I'm in contact with this living one inside of me who's so, so full of uh, life and joy and peace. I can't help it. I'm just, I'm just being, you know, sometimes believers are beaming, even in their suffering. Okay, again, here we have uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying. So Paul realized this outer man, it just has to decay. That's, the suffering is a part of that. Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. So there's the vision again, the renewal of the inner man for our momentary lightness of affliction. So he considered his affliction as being very light. I consider it very heavy. But to him, it was like, this is nothing compared to the surpassing eternal weight of glory that I'm gaining. So Paul was surely one that had a vision. And speaking of that, um, just this last verse I put was in the, it's in the same chapter. But listen to this. He said, so then death operates in us but life in you. And this is even a little bit more on the vision side and on our experience side that when we pass through sufferings, life is released to others, to other members in the body. So Paul realized like they were suffering as the apostles, but the believers in Corinth were getting life. How about that? <laughs> so, so we should, um, you know, have this have this consideration, oh man, I'm really in a suffering situation, but this, Lord, I give this to you right now, my suffering for the body of Christ. Build up the body. Give life to the other members. Give life to my roommate. Give life to my family. Give life to the other brothers and sisters. And I remember one brother, he was uh, passing through his 30s and into his 40s, and he still wasn't married. Okay, this was a huge suffering. He really wanted to get married, but, you know, the Lord just didn't arrange it for him. Um, so <laughs> you kind of have to have a wife to get married. So anyway, he didn't have one. And um, or no. Anyway, 
suffering. But he realized, he had the vision and he realized this suffering can work out to the, can benefit the body of Christ. And he consecrated it to the Lord. Lord, I give you this suffering for the building up of your body. I was so impressed by that, <laughs> you know, to have that kind of view and even that kind of consecration to turn to the Lord, contact the Lord, and even look to the Lord, that life would be released to the other members. Finally, there was a sister recently whose husband passed away. And I mean, talk about a suffering. I mean, she's grieving, you know, and everything. And um, But boy, we went and visited her and she didn't. I mean, yeah, she was sad, but she was also, you could tell she was in resurrection. She'd been contacting the Lord inside of her. And now I found out this week that she's actually, okay, that she's only been husbandless for a couple of weeks. I mean, I would think she's still very, she's the one that needs to be comforted, right? But, but I found out she's comforting another sister that's having some grieving issues. And I'm like, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> How can the grieving one be comforting another grieving one? It's because this first grieving one is filled with joy, not from the outward situation, but from the inner life inside of her. She's contacting the Lord who can turn her mourning into dancing, can take off her sackcloth, <laughs> you know, and so forth. So anyway, brothers and sisters, I hope we, uh, you know, could see something here about the two responses. Of course, we many times have the response of Job, and that's where we start. But if we turn to the Lord, and, and the, by his mercy, we have a vision. Our response will change. And hopefully in the future, you know, as time goes on more and more when we suffer, rather than cursing, complaining, and just waiting to die, we will be rejoicing, praying, singing, and praising, gaining God, and letting God flow out to the other members of the body. So I don't want to say praise the Lord for suffering. We don't. <laughs> but, you know, we do realize it's part of the, part of the, the uh, course. And uh, by the Lord's grace, we can uh, pass through and, and gain what we need to gain and, and we'll reach the goal. Praise the Lord. I'll stop there. <laughs>